Many thanks for the urology trainees all over the world joining us in this uh, YouTube channel to discuss various scenarios for urology exit exam. Today as a continuation we are discussing the rare scenarios possible in the urology exams. Based upon your country the scenarios what we discuss could be rare or could be quite usual but uh, from United Kingdom point of view these are relatively rare so we just want to cover them also in the next um, 40 to 60 minutes okay we are starting with the first scenario yes please thanks for allowing us to record it will be very handy for your own future revision and also for the other trainees who are not online today you had a patient referred from gynecology department the predominant symptom is she is leaking urine through vagina how are you going to evaluate her okay and is the patient having any recent surgery yes she had history of total abdominal hysterectomy with bilateral oophorectomy for cervical cancer six weeks back and the leak per vagina started two weeks after the surgery okay so i will uh... Um, the patient, I assume that the patient is coming to the clinic. So I, I will review the patient in the uh, clinic. I will take a brief history, do examination in the presence of chaperone and arrange some investigation. Uh, my concern is a possibility of a vaginal fistula or urethrovaginal uh, fistula following her um, uh, surgery for cancer. So I'll take a history from the patient asking about her baseline um, urological history, is there any difficulty in passing urine previously, any form of incontinence before the uh, surgery, um, whether the patient had before any previous surgery or radiotherapy, about her uh, medical background, the use of any medication, about uh, smoking, uh, drinking uh, habit, and um, also about her um, um, uh, social life and then after I will take the uh, history from the surgery onward uh, when the leak was started what is the severity of the leak um, how many pads she used daily apart from the leak is she having incontinence with the leak as well any visible hematuria any urinary tract uh, infection um, uh, the impact of uh, this leak on her social and sexual life and then I will proceed to um, uh, examination of the patient in the presence of chaperone with the patient concept, uh, starting by general examination, then uh, ab uh, abdominal examination, looking for any uh, palpable mass or tenderness in the loin, any palpable mass or tenderness in the suprapubic area. Then I will examine the perineum in the supine and the left lateral position, looking for any obvious abnormality like uterine diverticulum, um, uh, prolapse, uh, cystocele, rectocele. I will ask a patient to cough to see whether there is any leak. I will see if there is any visible uh, spontaneous leak uh, of uh, fluid or, or pooling of the fluid in the vagina. And then I will examine the patient with the help of Simpson speculum for further inspection. And uh, after that, uh, um, I will uh, try to uh, check the operative note for the patient to see what, what if there is any difficulty during the surgery. Uh, at that time, uh, any recognized uh, injury during the procedure, uh, what was the histology, the MDT decision, whether the patient is waiting to have a further treatment in form of radiotherapy or not. Um, I will ask the patient uh, also to uh, provide a urine sample for <clears throat> for uh, urine dipstick and uh, I will send for cultural sensitivity if there is a, a suspicion of infection. I will arrange for a baseline uh, full blood count kidney uh, function. I will send um, uh, some of this fluid if the patient uh, able to collect it. I will send the sample for estimation of uh, creatinine in the fluid and compare it with the serum creatinine and take it from there. Good. Again, very extensive, nice, comprehensive answer. Um, I'm going to raise a concern, but unfortunately, I don't have a proper answer or solution to that. In the exams, just look into the examiner's face and see how happy they are. Uh, if mm. they feel a bit apprehensive on you having such a open, big opening gambit try to cut short without losing the main things like looking into operative notes arranging upper track investigations and as you said comparing the 
urine from the vagina and the serum urine serum creatinine so just make the main points uh, because sometimes you will lose the precious time you can't discuss the scenario completely in 10 minutes but on uh, yeah. a, a good day this is absolutely fine but just keep that in the background that uh, a good opening gamete will give you a big 6 from the 6 you need to progress to 8 that's the main idea of the exam okay yes very good so just to answer some of your questions uh, she had a quite a difficult uh, surgery because of uh, the nature of the cancer in the cervix uh, no signs of any involvement of ureter during the surgery the surgeon haven't had any clue that there is a possibility of uh, injury to the bladder or ureter and uh, she's got continuous urine leak and um, the urine sample drained from the vagina did confirmed to be of urine as per the investigations as you said in comparison with the serum parameters and um, she had past history of three normal deliveries she is not medically having any diseases otherwise rest of the investigations were pretty normal she's quite healthy she's quite annoyed by this nuisance of urine leak which made her to wear con incontinence pads uh, continuously um, how are you going to take this further so after that i want to arrange for um, imaging to see uh, the source of the uh, fistula with the urinary tract. So I will arrange for the uh, patient to have a, a, a CT urogram uh, with a delay phase and a, a CT cystoscopy uh, as well uh, to see the site of the fistula and the location and other factors. Okay, her CT urogram showed uh, bilateral normal draining kidneys with no evidence of any hydroureteronephrosis. The contrast reaching the bladder comfortably. Unfortunately, there is a vesico-vaginal fistula resulting in the contrast leaking into the vagina. No signs of any abnormalities noted in the bladder. Rest of the abdominal contents, including intestines, were normal. Okay. So, um, in this case, since the um, uh, clinical investigation um, uh, supporting the uh, possibility of vesico-vaginal uh, fistula, then I will have a, a chat with the uh, patient uh, about uh, the best way to uh, repair this. Um, since the patient is with me in the clinic, I will arrange to, to have a flexible cystoscopy, which will give me an idea whether um, uh, the uh, fistula will be visible, the size of the fistula, uh, the location in the uh, bladder, which may be helpful in planning the treatment. I will explain to the patient since she had a recent, re relatively recent um, cancer surgery, it's not advisable to do um, uh, uh, a repair in short time. So I will allow um, the time for everything to settle. I explain to the patient that I totally understand it is quite inconvenient to have uh, this leak for further a few weeks. I will support the patient um, uh, with some uh, continence uh, appliance. I will involve a continence nurse uh, in the discussion. She will give her written information and contact details if she needs uh, any further support. And uh, my plan is to arrange for the patient to have a, a repair of the um, fistula in about three months from the initial surgery. Okay, your flexible stroscopy shows that uh, her uh, fistula is just above the interureteric bridge, just above the trigone. Rest of the bladder wall seems to be normal. There is uh, no signs of any suspicious lesion, good bladder capacity. And uh, the fistula is a definite finding, no evidence of any suspicious around the fistula. Just by visual appearance, it appears like 5 to 10 millimeters and um, it is corresponding to a small dimple in the anterior wall of the vagina also during the flexible cystoscopy. And why do you want to wait any further? She is now six weeks from post-op. She's quite tormented by this urine leak. Uh, the idea is that if we do the surgery early, the tissue in this area will be um, cemented and vascularity of the tissue is not optimal. So the rate of success of the fistula may be lower. So I would prefer to allow at least 10 to 12 weeks after the initial surgery, uh, and then we can do the uh, uh, fistulectomy. Okay. So is there any role for early repair? Say, for example, if the patient presented within such a such a date, you will do early repair. Is there any role? 
Uh, yeah, if the if the injury or the fistula was diagnosed very early, usually within one to two, uh, one week to ten days uh, following the injury, um, then there may be an, uh, a rule for early repair. But uh, if it is after two two weeks, it's better to give a, a time for the tissue to heal completely and then consider repair. Good. So it's mainly like we don't want the chronic inflammation to sit in. It's nice to operate in the early sitting, maybe in the presence of acute inflammation. But after 10 days, once the chronic inflammation sits in, you need to really wait for the tissues to regain its um, strength. And so what is the actual duration you wish to wait from the date of surgery? Uh, it's something between 10 to 12 uh, weeks. Okay, some people even um, go for a complete three months, as you said, 12 weeks. But 10 to 12 weeks means it's, uh, yeah, two and a half months, three months is good. You can say three months in the exam, which is much more standard. Okay, so what are you going to do? You are supporting her with the continent service and then you are seeing her in three months time. What's your plan? So my plan is uh, to arrange for the patient to have a, a, a transvaginal repair of the uh, fistula. Um, I am aware of that. Uh, we have two, mainly two uh, approach to repair the fistula, either transabdominal or transvaginal. Both of them, they have the same success rate. Uh, however, uh, the uh, rate of complication uh, is more with the transabdominal. Uh, the length of stay in hospital, need for catheter are, are more, uh, all of them are more with the transabdominal. Therefore, my plan is to arrange for a transvaginal uh, repair uh, with possible use of uh, marcius. Uh, fat pad uh, graft. What other conditions will help you to choose either transabdominal or transvaginal approach? Is the location of fistula makes any impact on that? Yes, the factors include the location of the fistula, the size of the uh, fistula, the experience of the surgeon, the presence of uh, any associated uh, uh, abnormality like in the vagina or in the abdomen uh, all will will help uh, to decide okay take me through the happenings on the surgery date so the patient will be admitted on the uh, day of the surgery um, um, she will be anesthetized uh, prepped uh, who checklist uh, prophylactic antibiotic uh, and then um, after that uh, we will do a um, a cystoscopy, identify the site of the uh, fistula and try to put a, a stent through the um, uh, fistula. Uh, and then uh, after that, transvaginally identify uh, the site of the fistula in the vagina as well. Uh, excision of the fistula tract, which will be sent for histology to exclude any uh, cancer. And then after that, uh, we will do a multi-layer uh, repair of the bladder separated from the vagina. It should be tension-free, watertight, multi-layer repair. I will try to avoid any overlapping of the suture uh, line. I will try to uh, keep a tissue interposition in between the vagina and the bladder. Therefore, I will use the Marcia's uh, fat pad. And then I will um, uh, keep a catheter uh, in the uh, bladder for at least uh, two weeks. And then I remove it after um, um, a cystogram confirming uh, no leak. Um, I will keep the patient on a prophylactic antibiotic. I will advise the patient to avoid any six winter course for at least uh, uh, six weeks uh, following that. Okay, take me through the Martius flap. What is the types or blood supply and how are you going to harvest it? So usually it is uh, the marshes, um, it's taken from the uh, labia. It is an epileptical um, uh, uh, flap of a skin with the underlying uh, fat pad. Uh, it, if it is taken from the upper part of the labia, then it will be relying on the um, external uh, pudendal nerve if it is taken from the lower part uh, it is will be relying on the uh, internal pudendal uh, sorry artery if it is taken from the upper part uh, external pudendal artery from the lower part um, internal pudendal uh, artery um, um, I will take this uh, uh, flap and then uh, rotate it to um, suture it in between the uh, bladder and the vagina to reduce the uh, chance of recurrence of the fistula. And I will inform the patient about the possibility of uh, prosthesia and diminished sensation in the area of the uh, uh, graft. Okay. 
um, take me through the sutra material which you are going to use and what type of catheter you are going to place. So I will use an unabsorbable uh, suture. So for the closure of the bladder, I will use a two of vicryl, a two layer repair. And for the vagina, I will use the same suture and I will leave a, a 14 a French uh, urethral catheter at the end. Okay. What is the difference if you are approaching this uh, fistula transabdominally? Uh, the main difference is that I will do I will use the momentum um, for interposition between the vagina and the bladder. Okay, happy to have another scenario. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. You have a patient presented by the referred by the gynecologist for right-sided hydroureteronephrosis. The patient had right-sided large ovarian cyst removal. Postoperatively, she was well for almost six weeks, but then developed a nagging right-side loin pain for which they did ultrasound which showed right-side hydroureteronephrosis. The surgeon felt that it could be related to the right-side oophorectomy surgery. How are you going to evaluate her? So I'll see this patient in my clinic. Um, I will take a brief history uh, examination in the presence of chaperone with the patient's consent and arrange for investigation. Uh, I will review the operative note uh, uh, prior to reviewing the patient. Um, I will check the histology from the ovarian cyst and uh, I will see the plan if there are any further treatment needed from the gynecology uh, side. I will take a patient's uh, history about any pain at the moment. Uh, any history of uh, fever, um, rigor, feeling unwell, um, any visible hematuria, any urinary incontinence or a leak about her past medical and surgical history, previous gynecological history, uh, drug allergies. And then I'll examine the patient in the prison of chapel with the patient consent, looking for any palpable mass of tenderness in the loin, any palpable uh, bladder, um, examine, um, inspect the genitalia and examination with the Simpson speculum. And after that, I will do urine tests for uh, urine dipstick. I will arrange for a baseline uh, full blood count and renal function. And I will arrange for the patient to have a contrasted CT urinary tract since my concern is a possible uh, ligation of the right ureter during uh, the uh, cystectomy procedure. Okay. Her investigations were normal, no signs of any inflammatory markers increase. Her CT urogram did show right side hydrated nephrosis and there is a sharp cutoff at the level of the just distal to crossing vessels. Her left kidney seems to be functioning well without any blockade, contrast reaching bladder adequately. What are you going to do? So for um, this patient, uh, my preferred approach is uh, um, to do uh, the minimally invasive via cystoscopy, retrograde study and possible insertion of a stent if it is possible. So I will consent the patient uh, for a GI procedure involving cystoscopy, uh, retrograde study, and then I will try to uh, pass a guide wire followed by a catheter insertion uh, to mag to mag to increase the chance of success of my procedure. I will arrange with one of my intervention radiologist colleague to be available in case we can't uh, approach it from down below, then he will be ready. He can do a uh, nephrostomy, percutaneous nephrostomy, and then uh, possibly try to insert an anti-grade uh, stent. It's like a rendezvous procedure, uh, which may um, help to bypass uh, the stricture if it's possible. Okay, how will you do this rando procedure? So uh, it will be done by a surgeon uh, from down below and uh, an intervention radiologist from the kidney. I will start by doing cystoscopy retrograde study to identify the um, distal uh, segment of the ureter. At the same time, the radiologist will uh, put an nephrostomy, which should be straightforward since the system is dilated. Uh, he will put some contrast so we can see the uh, uh, cutoff of the upper segment of the ureter and then we can determine the length of the um, uh, injured segment of the ureter. I will try to pass a guide wire if, I'm, if I can, if not, then he will try to pass a guide wire from uh, upward uh, and then if he is successful, we can uh, leave an integrated stent in place. 
Okay, if there is uh, no way the guide wire can be passed both retrograde or anti-grade, what other choices you have? So in this case, since it is six weeks since the uh, injury, um, I will just ask the uh, radiologist to keep a nephrostomy in place, uh, which will relieve the obstruction in the kidney and preserve the kidney function. And then I will arrange for the patient to have an open uh, repair at three months from the initial surgery. Okay. Just to add there, uh, rando procedure not only stops just with uh, passing the guide wire. In case if the structure is so tight and it is not possible with the guide wire, for example, from below a surgeon can have a semirigidity retroscope, from above a surgeon can have a flexible retroscope and um, one of them can switch off the light source and they can see the light source from the other partner and try to use a laser to create a channel on the scar and yeah. uh, that can help to pass the guide wire and then you can do a balloon dilatation in the same sitting try to put as much bigger stent as possible sometimes we can do more than 4.5 french which is okay to start with and then later once things getting epithelized, we can slowly do a balloon dilatation and do some reconstruction also. Let us assume that your patient, uh, they are not able to see the light uh, across and they are not able to do a kind of a tunneling. As you said, she has a nephrostomy in place. So how are you going to reconstruct her? So I will consent the patient uh, for an open uh, exploration and repair of the right ureter. Um, uh, and uh, the, the information that we get from the uh, um, anti-grade and retrograde uh, uh, pilogram should should let us know exactly the site and the length of the uh, defect on the ureter. If it is in the lower ureter and it is less than two centimeter, uh, which could be due to just a, a, a suture or ligature, then I uh, may be able to um, just excise the segment and do direct ureterostomy. If the segment uh, is a little bit uh, longer in the lower ureter, then I'll try to do ureteric re-implantation with or without SOAS H. Uh, if the defect is in the uh, middle part of the ureter, uh, then I will uh, try to do uh, again either ureterostomy, transurethroeurotrostomy, or uh, boar flap. Take me through the transurethroeurotrostomy procedure. So for transurethroeurotrostomy, I will um, attach, I will try to um, do a limited dissection of the uh, right uh, ureter with the preservation of uh, vascularity. And then I will try to anastomose the right ureter uh, uh, side to end into the uh, left ureter. We need to exclude uh, the presence of uh, certain disease before the transurethroeurotrostomy, like the presence of upper tract TCC, uh, stones, um, stricture on the uh, left ureter, and any distal obstruction. Um, um, after that, I will try to do the dissection of the right uh, ureter, uh, preferably retroperitoneal if it is possible. Uh, and then I can uh, take it into the left side and do the uh, uh, end to side anastomosis. Uh, I will put a stent, I will do spatulation. Uh, watertight, uh, tension-free anastomosis. I will leave a non-suction uh, drain and I will leave a urethral catheter in the bladder. Um, sometime, uh, if the inferior mesenteric artery is uh, in the way, uh, sometime we may need to do an um, ligation of the inferior mesenteric artery. Okay. In the exam, you need to add that, say, for example, our scenario has got the injury in the right ureter. You need to mention that I am aware that I am using the normal non-injured lift pelvic alicial and ureteric system and uh, it is a normal system. By chance if there is a problem in the transurethral ureterostomy, you may jeopardize the drainage from the left kidney also. So yeah. I will run through this uh, significant uh, possibility preoperatively with the patient because end-to-end -end ureterostomy, especially if it is a upper ureteric stricture, is a quite an ideal choice. Other options, as you said. Take me through the SOAS hitch procedure. So for the uh, SOAS uh, hitch, uh, we, our aim is to uh, 
uh, give the bladder extra length uh, to uh, shorten the um, defect by uh, suturing the bladder into the tendon of psoas minor muscle. So I will do uh, a small longitudinal uh, systemy incision and then I'll put uh, inspect the bladder from inside, make sure that the bladder has a good capacity, no other pathology inside. And then I'll put my fingers and pushing the bladder as much as possible toward the uh, was a minor tendon on that side. Uh, if the uh, if the mobility of the bladder is limited, then I need to do a ligation of the superior vesicle pedicle on the contralateral side. And then after that, I will use um, uh, a PDS, a 2-0 PDS for fixation of the bladder into the psoas minor tendon. I will be uh, careful not to injure the genitofemoral nerve, which is close to the um, psoas minor tendon. Um, and then after that, we um, can either do a direct, uh, after that, I, I should be able to do a direct uh, reimplantation of the ureter into the bladder. And the sausage will give a support uh, for the uh, support and stability for the reimplantation. And then I will close the bladder over a catheter. How will you identify the genitofemoral now? Uh, usually it's visible by inspection. It should be a lateral to the psoas minor muscle. Okay. Take me through the Bawari flap procedure. So for the Bawari flap, we should ensure that the patient has a, a adequate functional bladder capacity, no previous history of bladder surgery or uh, radiotherapy. Uh, uh, the most important principle in creating Bawari flap is a wide base. Uh, and the length to the base should be four to one to ensure adequate vascularity. So I will um, do uh, a U-shape uh, incision with the cautery. I will measure the defect in the uh, ureter, and then I will uh, take um, a U-shape a flap from the uh, dome of the bladder, and then reflect it upward, tubularize it, and then um, I will do an astomosis of the ureter to the. Um, uh, this flap, I will try to do, uh, I will to do some mucosal tunneling of the ureter in order to reduce the rate of uh, reflux. Uh, I will put a stent through the repair. I will leave a catheter and abdominal drain um, and take it from there. Okay. And um, how are you going to follow up this patient? Let us assume your patient required a bovary flap with a stent in place. So for this patient, I will keep, uh, uh, I will take the drain uh, first within two to three days where if the drain is not draining anything more than 40 mil per day, I will take the drain out first. The patient will be discharged on antibiotic in the presence of urethral catheter and urethric stent. I'll bring the patient back in two weeks for cystogram. And then if there is no leak uh, from the bladder or from the bowel flap, I will take the urethral catheter out and then uh, I will take the stent in about six weeks. This patient will need a long-term follow-up uh, since I'm concerned about uh, the possibility of stricture at the site of the anastomosis. Uh, therefore, I will arrange for the patient uh, to have a follow-up in uh, three months time by having a blood test, check the kidney function. I will arrange for ultrasound to check if there's any hydronephrosis and I will uh, do also um, a MAG3 study um, to check the cyclotrenal function and to exclude any obstruction. If there is any concern from the ultrasound or MAG3 about a, a, a possible stricture, then I will arrange for a procedure in the form of cystoscopy, retrograde, plus minus erythroscopy. Okay. Um, just when you are saying the catheter instead of urethral catheter, uh, just spell it as bladder catheter because you will be saying uretric on and off. So the examiner should not get confused about uretric catheter. So instead of urethral catheter, say bladder catheter. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Good. What kind of complications you may explain and you may expect in the Bowery flap? So the possible complication related to the bladder or to the flap, to the bladder, there may be reduction in the functional capacity of the uh, bladder and the patient uh, develops some, uh, symptoms of frequency and urgency and uh, uh, pain 
Um, usually the bladder is a generous organ and by time there will be um, dilatation or will be stretching of the bladder and most of the time the bladder will uh, regain its functional capacity. Uh, regarding the site of anastomosis, there is a possibility of um, stricture uh, at that site, a uh, possibility of uh, reflux. Okay. Let us go to the next scenario. Are you happy with that? Yeah, yeah. Are we getting uh, like a feedback at the end? Yes, I'll give you a feedback in the end. Thank but you, no major concerns. If there is anything, I'll get back to you then and there. Good. You have a patient uh, post radical prostatectomy presenting with significant stress urinary incontinence almost from the day he had his radical robotic assisted prostatectomy. How are you going to evaluate him? Uh, sorry, how, how long the, down the line where yeah. I'm seeing the patient after how many months? Yeah, it's six weeks from the surgery. Oh, so good. So I review this patient in my clinic. Um, I will um, check the operative note of the surgery, whether it is done robotically or open, any difficulty encountered during the um, surgery, um, whether the whether nervous sparing was done or not. I will check the histology regarding the margins, uh, regarding the final histology, MDT outcome to see if the patient is supposed to have uh, further adjuvant therapy, uh, any radiotherapy or uh, not. All this information are important. Uh, if there's any PSA done uh, postoperatively to know his uh, baseline PSA, I will ask a patient in the history about his uh, previous uh, urological history, there is any voiding or storage lots previously, any incontinence, visible hematuria, any history of UTI. His baseline continence status uh, and age is important to expect um, uh, his outcome following the surgery. I will ask also about his uh, medical history, any history of diabetes, other medication, um, uh, any previous uh, radiotherapy uh, prior to his surgery. Uh, whether he is a smoker, type of fluid and drink that he is taking. I will ask about the current incontinence, uh, how many pads he is using daily and the impact of that on his uh, social and sexual life. I will ask about his sexual function uh, as well and whether he is uh, uh, constipated or uh, not. And then I will proceed to examination the presence of chaperon with the patient consent. Um, I will examine the patient uh, looking for any uh, palpable uh, bladder. I will examine the genitalia and, uh, and arrange for the patient to have a urine dip stick, uh, um, to have a flow rate and bladder scan. I will give him the uh, IPSS form also to assess his, uh, uh, his uh, lower urinary tract symptoms and I take it from there. Okay. Examination wise, he's quite thin built. There is no concerns from the oncology point of view. The histology showed Gleason score 4 plus 4. Good expected PSA outcome. There is no margin positive in the resected prostate. There is no need for lymph node resection. So patient haven't had any lymph node resection. Examination wise, digital examination was normal, flat surface and uh, you did a flexible cystoscopy, erythrocystoscopy, which showed normal urethra and adequate anastomosis, no signs of anything like uh, anastomotic stricture, but uh, the main concern is the patient's incontinence and otherwise he's quite fit. How are you going to treat him? Yeah, so my main concern are three uh, possibility for post prostatectomy incontinence. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Well, the post prostatectomy incontinence, one of them excluded, which is bladder neck contracture or thrust stricture. The other possibility is de novo uh, bladder overactivity or stress incontinence related to sphincter weakness. Um, I want just to mention that one of the things that help to predict uh, the outcome of uh, continence after the surgery is uh, the um, anatomical functional length of the urethra preoperatively which may help to predict the outcome uh, for this patient usually we start conservatively by explaining that this is one of the known complication of uh, prosthetic surgery unfortunately support the patient psychologically involve the continence nurse provide him with a, a continence supplement and usually we uh, allow uh, for at least six months uh, for conservative treatment i will make sure that the patient is already doing the pelvic floor exercise uh, which may help to improve sometime if the patient is not able 
to do it properly. Um, I will involve the physiotherapist with the possibility of biofeedback or electrical stimulation, which may help to improve the outcome of pelvic floor uh, therapy, which may be helpful on the short term in about 30 to 40 percent of the patient. Um, I will arrange for the uh, patient to be seen again um, uh, at six months from his surgery. How the biofeedback works? So the biofeedback is uh, some of the patients that are struggling to perform the pelvic floor exercise uh, properly. So we provide the patient with either um, audio, uh, video, or tactile uh, feedback so he can um, identify and appreciate uh, the pelvic floor muscle uh, more, and then he can do the pelvic floor exercise uh, properly. Okay. Let us assume you are doing everything possible, but the patient has no improvement and he is quite diligently following your advice of physiotherapy, etc. And uh, he is just putting up with uh, incontinence pads for months and months. And now the stage of five to six months has reached. What other options do you have for him? So usually um, uh, the natural history of continence following the process surgery that it will improve by time and to start with uh, about uh, 60 to 70 percent of the patient they will have some form of incontinence but by the end of the first year only five to ten percent of the patient will need uh, zero to one pad per day. Uh, however, if the patient is having a significant incontinence try the conservative therapy and he is quite annoyed by that then we can uh, consider treatment at uh, six months. For this patient, I want to complete his investigation uh, by doing a video urodynamic uh, for further assessment of his uh, bladder and the bladder neck. I will discuss his case in the pelvic uh, MDT uh, and then I take it from there. Why do you want to do video urodynamic specifically? What is the input you are expecting? Uh, because this is a, a complex form of incontinence following surgery. So I want to see uh, whether there is any um, bladder overactivity, uh, whether there is a reduced compliance or not. I want to see his voiding, uh, a bladder contraction, and to see the uh, bladder neck during voiding, if there is any um, thing uh, um, related to the decision to do uh, the repair. Um, also, it is important to have a 24-hour pad weight which give us an idea about the severity of incontinence. If it is uh, zero to 100 gram, this is mild. 100 to 300 uh, gram uh, is uh, moderate. And if it is more than 300 gram, this is a severe incontinence, which is an indication for early repair. Okay, at one point, you can also have a kind of a bladder diary, which will tell you about his caffeine intake, water intake, get history about constipation, use other conservative measures like for example if he's a smoker you need you need to be quit smoking and also stopping the effervescent drinks or caffeinated drinks okay all the investigations pointing out that uh, the main problem is with the sphincter so what is your protocol how are you going to treat him so i will i will start treatment with um conservative uh, measure, especially if the patient is uh, not that fit, I will start with the urethral bulking agent, uh, which uh, may help to give a temporary leave. I inform the patient that this uh, give him a temporary leave, it may need to be repeated. Um, deloxetine also can be tried and it may give uh, um, patient some improvement. However, with such a significant uh, incontinence, I think the patient is heading toward uh, a surgery. Uh, if the incontinence is mild to moderate, according to the 24-hour uh, pad weight, then I can offer the patient either uh, a sling or uh, uh, artificial um, urethral sphincter, according to the master's study, which showed no non-inferiority of the sling uh, for the management of uh, mild to moderate uh, stress incontinence uh, post prostatectomy. Okay, take me through the bulking agents used in this purpose. So the bulking agent mainly we are using um, um, uh, polyacry polyacrymyl uh, hydrogel, which is bulkamid. Uh, it is uh, injected uh, at three sites. Uh, and the urethra it will cause a co-optation of the urethral mucosa and increase the outlet resistance, which may help to improve continence. However, 
Um, I inform the patient that this is a, a, a permanent substance, uh, but the effect may wear off with time and he may need to have a repeated injection. The overall success rate is around 50 to 70% with the uh, bulking agent. The other one, which is less used uh, nowadays, is the macroplastic, which is silicone, because it's associated with more uh, migration and extrusion into the bladder. Okay. Um, take me through the sling surgeries. What type of slings you are planning to use? So we have mainly three form of uh, sling. We have uh, advance, which is a transobturator uh, sling applied at the bulbar urethra. We have the invance, which is um, uh, a bone anchoring sling. So the sling will be anchored to the uh, pubic bones by screw. And we have the third form from coloplast called Virtu, which composed of uh, four threads. Uh, it is a sling attached to four threads. Uh, two of the threads will be fixed to the upper inner thigh, and two of the threads will be fixed to the uh, um, uh, suprapubic area. And then by stretching of these uh, four legs, um, this will give uh, uh, support uh, to the uh, bulbar urethra. So these are the main types of things that I'm aware of. Okay. After going through various press publications on these uh, prosthetic slings, patient is not very happy with the option. Is there any other autologous slings you are aware of? Uh, autologous, I'm aware of uh, the um, uh, autologous. We can use a, a, a sling from the rectus sheath. Um, which in, in, in a principle similar to the one used by uh, used in female for stress and urinary incontinence. So we do a sling uh, two by 10 centimeter. Um, we take a, a, um, a segment of the rectus sheath and then we apply it around the urethra and we suspend it on, on, uh, on, uh, on sutures. This may help to improve his incontinence as well. Yeah, you can even use the tensor fascia later. So like women, there is an equal um, opportunity to use the autologous slings, uh, which at least you need to give it as an option when you are discussing the prosthetic uh, mesh-based slings. Okay, so I was not aware that we can use it like a, like a female. Good. Yeah, uh, because of the present uh, changes in the female approach, it's better to give them as an option. Mm. What do these mesh were made of? What type of material? What are the characteristics? Um, they are uh, mainly uh, made of proline, as far as I know, and uh, it's preferred to uh, to be of type one, which is macroporous uh, polypropylene mesh. Okay, patient has quite carefully read through the literature which you have given to him, patient information leaflet, and uh, is quite understanding your words. He wished to go for a surgery which gives uh, ultimate absolute dryness and like a final best care. So what other best care you have for him? Um, the best option uh, is to use the artificial urinary sphincter, the three pieces, which is associated with a success rate of 85 to 90% compared to 75 to 80% with the sling. It's associated with better satisfaction, uh, less complication and less, uh, sorry, it's associated with a better satisfaction and less revision rate uh, from the sling. However, uh, it has a um, uh, problem like mechanical problem, uh, infection, um, erosion, uh, failure to control his continence, uh, the need to be exchanged sometime, and also it may induce uh, de novo bladder overactivity and uh, upper tract dilatation on some patient. So if the patient is, is happy to go ahead, uh, then I will consent him for the artificial urinary sphincter uh, insertion. Okay, explain the three-piece processes. What are all the components? So the, the, the main one is used is the AMS 800. It composed of uh, three component, uh, a cuff around the bulbar urethra, and, uh, a control uh, pump uh, in the scrotum, and then a reservoir in the uh, uh, retropubic area. And the, the cuff usually will work by a fluid uh, in the cuff, which is, which is about 60 to 70 mil. 
fluid in the cuff, which is enough to uh, give uh, continence for the patient. So most of the time, the cuff will be activated. Uh, when the patient wants to pass uh, urine, then he need to um, squeeze the control pump a few times, and this will release the pressure. A patient will pass urine, and then the cuff will refill spontaneously within 90 to 120 uh, second uh, following that. A patient need to be motivated. Uh, he need to have a good uh, manual uh, handling to operate uh, uh, the pump. And we need to exclude the presence of any urethral stricture and the presence of any upper tract dilatation or uncontrolled bladder overactivity before the insertion. Okay, take me through the main steps in the surgical aspects. So for any prosthesis insertion, we need to take a, an extra precaution to prevent any infection. So um, I will check the swab of the patient, MRSA and urine sample before we before he came to the surgery, optimize any medical com condition like diabetes. And then the patient will be admitted on the day of the uh, surgery. I advise the patient not to do any uh, hair removal. Um, Patient procedure needs to be done on a theater with a laminar flow, uh, like the pediatric theater, uh, sorry, the orthopedic theater. And then the patient should be the first on the list. I make sure that we have the implant, the correct size uh, available. Uh, we will uh, do hair removal by uh, uh, clapper, uh, clipping rather than by uh, the razor. Uh, I will uh, give the patient a prophylactic dose of antibiotic covering both the gram positive and the gram negative microorganisms. Then we will do um, um, a good uh, cleaning of the area with betadine for about 10 to 15 minutes. I will use the double glove technique, non touch technique. Um, uh, most of the uh, 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 implant nowadays are impregnated in antibiotic. If not, then I will uh, use an antibiotic solution as well intraoperatively. I try to minimize the number of staff, close the door during the surgery, try to avoid any hematoma as much as possible, try to avoid the use of a drain and shorten the procedure. Uh, after the procedure, uh, I will uh, keep the patient on antibiotic for uh, 24 uh, uh, hour and usually uh, we review him in two weeks time to make sure that there is no early complication and then we start recycling and the use of the uh, sphincter in uh, six week time okay so when are you planning to remove the catheter so i will keep a catheter uh, temporarily for uh, usually about uh, uh, five to seven days and then we'll take the catheter out uh, sorry so i need to keep the catheter until I start the activation of the of the sphincter, which is about six weeks. I'm okay. not sure. Okay, good. Now this patient now settling very well with the artificial urinary sphincter and is now stable for almost like uh, two years. But unfortunately, on one fine night, he presents with uh, emergency room with inability to deflate the sphincter. So what is happening? How can you help him? Okay, so I I see the patient. I'll make sure that he is comfortable. I'll check his bladder to see if there is any um, descended bladder, whether he's a retention or not at the moment. I will check his OPS. And my suspicion is that it could be a mechanical failure in the, uh, in the pump, which caused a failure to uh, deflate. Okay. So, how are you going to treat him? Uh, so, so I will try uh, to deactivate uh, the the sphincter first uh, by uh, yes yeah, deactivate yeah by by I will I will but it is uh, because one of the ways is to try to touch the the pump many times and then. Uh, if the fluid is start to uh, deflate, but no, it's, it, it will not going to work in this patient. Uh, okay. I'm, not, I'm, I'm not sure. Okay, so obviously this patient is uh, um, quite anxious and he has already tried multiple times trying to deflate the spinter as you can expect. So the correct answer would be, there is a kind of a small knob in the superior surface of the, the scrotal component which we use to deflate. 
if that mm. knob is uh, switched off the sphincter will go to a permanent deflated state then a uh, patient can pass urine on himself or the best way is you can pass a foot in french catheter which will be a good choice uh, the other thing which you need to bring in is uh, you should strongly advise the patient to tell the doctors that nobody should unnecessarily catheterize him forcefully passing a catheter especially in a non deflated sphincter could result in significant erosion and yeah. uh, that particular uh, device will get uh, non useful and then you need a revision surgery and things become more complex so if you are able to deflate it adequately then possibly the only defect could be that uh, inflation deflation device the scrotal component which can be easily replaced compared to replacing the whole revision surgery of cuff reservoir everything okay yeah good this is maybe like one of the emergency presentations which could be asked quite rarely i'm just trying to pick everything under the sun so that we are not leaving any stone unturned before the exams okay yeah thank you good happy to go for one more last scenario yes please okay um you have a 40 year old male presented to your erectile dysfunction clinic he is having this problem of erectile dysfunction for the past 6 uh, months to 1 year he tried uh, various uh, pd5 inhibitors in various combinations and um, he had initially good improvement but now the day has come where none of the medications are working and he wants to explore further surgical options how are you going to counsel him i will see this patient in my uh, clinic um, uh, i think that this patient is heading toward uh, a penile uh, implant prosthesis i will see the patient with his partner preferably i will uh, explain uh, about the option of uh, penile prosthesis that this is the last uh, resort of treatment uh, 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 it it's in some way irreversible because the patient cannot uh, restore the natural uh, erection following the insertion of the uh, prosthesis i will explain that uh, this instrument is composed of a two cylinder uh, uh, compose a reservoir and a pump in the scrotum. Uh, the insertion can be done under general anesthesia. I will counsel the patient uh, about the side effect, including early side effect like infection, bruises, uh, pain, uh, and late uh, side of, uh, sorry, and also the injury during the dilatation, include corporal injury or urethral injury, uh, late complication like suboptimal uh, erection, uh, uh, maybe shortening of the length occasionally, um, uh, dissatisfaction with the result, possibility of mechanical failure, auto-inflation, um, uh, uh, erosion, um, uh, there is a lack of uh, erection or rigidity in the uh, glands. So if the patient is happy with everything, I will usually prefer to see the patient twice with his partner, make sure that he understand all the information, information sync well with him, and then I will proceed to the surgery. Okay, explain the three-part processes. So the three-part processes, which is commonly used now, composed of uh, a two-cylinder and a reservoir, which is uh, full of fluid. Usually the reservoir will be located in the retropubic uh, uh, area and there is a pump in the scrotum so when the patient squeezes the pump they will be pumping of the fluid from the reservoir into the cylinder which will give him a, a good uh, length rigidity and girth uh, and then the patient can have sexual intercourse and then he deactivated when he finished so the three pieces uh, processes give the patient a good erection and good flaccidity as well in comparison with the uh, malleable or semi-rigid uh, processes Okay, in which way this is different from two-part processes? Is there any advantage in two-part processes? So the two-part processes, there is uh, no reservoir. It's mainly uh, uh, a pump and the reservoir at the same time, which is in the scrotum and two cylinder inside the corpora. Um, the advantage is that uh, mainly uh, in patients who have a previous abdominal or pelvic surgery, and we are concerned about uh, possible uh, bowel injury during the insertion of the reservoir in the retropubic area, so we will avoid this risk with the uh, two pieces uh, uh, processes. And the incidence of uh, mechanical failure and complication a little bit uh, less with the two pieces one. Okay. Is there any other simple processes available? Any other options for the patient? 
The other option is the semi-rigid or malleable prosthesis, uh, which are easy to insert, uh, associated with less mechanical failure, less infection. Uh, but the problem is that uh, the satisfaction uh, with them is quite low since they don't offer the patient a rigid erection and they are not completely flaccid uh, when the patient is not using uh, them and it may be associated with risk of uh, erosion on the long term. Okay. What are the material made up of these two-part processes or malleable processes? What is the construction of this material? Um, I think it's mainly composed of um, um, silicon. Um, I am aware about the new version of the three-way, of the three pieces uh, uh, processes that it, it's made of hydrophilic substance. So it can absorb the antibiotic like gentamicin and this will reduce uh, the rate of infection and uh, most of them they will come impregnated in antibiotic uh, like rifampicin as well uh, and all this will reduce the rate of infection yes apart from this the malleable processes may have some time uh, metal spring in core which is the one which helps uh, makes it malleable and maintains the position if the patient needs a sexual intercourse okay Okay, a patient presents with a kind of erosion due to the prosthesis. You can take an example like a malleable prosthesis. How are you going to salvage him? Urethral erosion. Yeah, since there is a urethral erosion, uh, then we are concerned about infection. So uh, we need to remove the, uh, the prosthesis, the semi-rigid prosthesis. And uh, we need to uh, repair the defect in the uh, urethra. Uh, antibiotic cover allow the everything to heal and then we can arrange for reinsertion of the um, processes later on okay very good um, I'm quite happy with what we have discussed today I don't want to stretch further you need some voice rest also <coughs> any other questions or doubts you have before we conclude today uh, no nothing specifically just to have a feedback because I was not 100% sure from all the answer that I give. No. I, uh, I mean, your answers are spot on. Only in few places where you have slightly deviated, I tried to jump in then and there rather than leaving it for the last end. Um, there are a few things, uh, for example, if if you are having a vesicovaginal fistula, uh, the best way to say is I will operate in three months time so that the whole chronic inflammation will settle down. While oh. you said 10 to 12 weeks, which indirectly the same. So these kind of small things, usually the examiners won't bother much. So I will say you are spot on 90% of the time. 10% of the time when you give a kind of a, a range, you, your one, ans one part of the range is still perfectly in the answer. So it doesn't matter at all. Um, I have no concerns on whatever the feedback I've given then and there. Uh, if you have no other questions, I'm very happy with the performance. Just chill out and maintain the same pace. Good. Thank you very much. Can I ask about one thing? I think one of my um, friend who had the exam before, he had a, a history of this uh, case of vaginal fistula in a newly pregnant lady. But the presentation was a quite uh, in short time, I think, maybe in the first two to three weeks, uh, um, the patient was not, um, I think was not fit to have the surgery or not keen to have the surgery. So he decided, just suggested to put a nephrostomy and a catheter, which is mentioned in one of the lectures that we have in the BOWS course. But the examiner was quite upset with that. And he said, how we will, how we will uh, think about putting a nephrostomy in a newly delivered lady? So I don't know because this is one of the options is conservative treatment of fistula. If it is a small one, uh, then we can put a catheter, bilateral nephrostomy and uh, keep it for three months, which may help to heal the fistula. But is it wise to mention it in the exam or not? If it is a vesicovaginal fistula, the nephrostomy won't help that much. Say, for example, if there is a uretric injury, then it's a different ball game. If it is mm. a vesicovaginal fistula, a good 16 French silicon catheter so that it is not get compressed like any other normal Foley catheter and uh, it will drain the bladder in a good way and um, the nephrostomy will only divert the urine more if it is a big fistula 
whatever you do whether you do nephrostomy or whether you nephrostomy won't divert bilateral nephrostomy won't divert bilaterally all the urine away definitely patient will still have urine draining into the bladder because peristalsis will be there and then only that only you are having the bladder catheter so the yeah. examiner may not be happy because you are placing bilateral nephrostomy which is quite an uncomfortable procedure for uh, bladder vesicovaginal fistula and uh, a good bladder catheter is enough to bypass but in spite of the bladder catheter she, she may have some leak the one thing which is quite clear is primary repair and secondary repair you can label it like this primary repair is the one where on table if there is a bladder injury post cesarean or post hysterectomy you are repairing it that's one or within one or two weeks if the patient presents with a problem you can still repair maximum i will say 3 weeks is the maximum age if it crosses that chronic inflammation will set in and then as you said the tissue won't be good enough for the repair to take in so a patient needs to put up with the incontinence pads at least for 3 months then we can do a proper secondary repair with interposition the one other thing you can say is uh, you can make sure that the anast the suture layer in the bladder and the vagina or not parallel to each other it could be like a cross if this is the bladder if you are bivalving like a vertical incision in the vagina it could be a horizontal incision so the place where they cross each other is only at one point and that point also nicely secured by a omental flap when you are doing transabdominal repair or a morsius flap if you are doing a transvaginal repair and and is there any factor to decide uh, regarding the site of the fistula whether it is inside the abdominal or transvaginal yes if it is a trigonal fistula if it is a small fistula if it is just supratrigonal which you can judge from your flexible stroscopy transvaginal is a good choice the only disadvantage is sometime transvaginally you are not able to do the morsius flap in all the ladies it's not possible while if it is fistula more towards the dome if it is a very large fistula transabdominal is the better choice which will help you to refashion the vaginal stump if you want because end of the day vaginal stump is just a stump and um, you can also make sure you got a good omentum to be inside which is much more secure and a quite large partition between the vagina and the bladder okay thank you very much so site and size of the fistula both could be taken into context uh, before mm -hmm. deciding which one you want yeah thank you very much good any other questions i uh, know thank you very much it was a very good uh, session cover a lot of hidden uh, corners yes yes and it will be a very good revision co revision source also you can just hear this again before your exam on one of the day do this revision bit early because closer to the exam i wish you to revise only the common questions rare scenarios you should finish by this week and no need to touch them in the exam week yeah thank you very much good wishing you a quiet uh, weekend and uh, if there is a possible time slot i will try to ping you tomorrow uh, if good. not we will do something on monday thank you thank you very much have good. a nice weekend have a nice rest of the day all is well thank you